Welcome back folks, it's Matmus, and thank you so much for joining me on this video today. We are delving back into the world of aircraft, and yes, we are looking at the beautiful, absolutely beautiful, Eurofighter Typhoon. Now once again, this aircraft does touch to me a little bit, because it is one of my biggest air superiority fighters of the United Kingdom, and therefore I'm going to have a little bit of bias towards it, of course. Um, I'm just kidding, no, I, I try my best not to be biased towards aircraft. At the end of the day, I am not an expert when it comes to fighter jets in any way, shape or form. Any information or research that I do is coming from sources that I hopefully are the best, <laughs> but it's difficult to say. Um, so as always guys, we will discuss this aircraft's history, its specifications, what it can do, its features, and then finally my own opinion on it, which as always isn't much because I'm not a fighter pilot, I'm not in the Air Force, I know very little about fighter jets, it's purely what I'm determining from research. Now as you can see, these jets are just gorgeous, tiny little things to be honest, but twin engine, and a lot of people um, you know, are very biased when it comes to twin engine and single engine. I gotta admit, I, I do understand the appreciation for twin engine fighter jets, it makes a lot of sense if one engine fails. I work in the aviation industry, so I understand that, you know, uh, twin engine systems are going to be a lot more reliable, a lot more safe, so to speak, than, uh, say, single engine aircraft. However, there's a lot of debate between that. But anyway, I digress. So first of all, you know the story if you're already subscribed to my channel. We're going to go over a little bit about this aircraft's history and then what it can do. So, in the last decades of the Cold War, most of the major players in the drama that had begun had actually started programs to develop the fourth generation air superiority fighter aircraft. Since the cost of such a leading edge machine was extremely painful for most governments, a number of European nations decided to collaborate on the development of what would be known as the European Fighter Aircraft, or simply Eurofighter, along with the more colourful name of Typhoon, which I personally think is a badass name. The end of the Cold War meant that the need for a fourth generation fighter was not as great as it had been, but the Eurofighter program continued, if with delays and changes in direction, and Europe's premier fighter is now fully in service. The Eurofighter Typhoon has joined the Dassault Rafale, the Saab Gripen, and the Sukhoi Flanker in pursuit of a growing niche in the international fighter market. These aircraft offer capabilities beyond Generation 4 platforms developed in the 1970s, but don't carry the costs and complications of stealth aircraft. While the Eurofighter has enjoyed the outstanding technical success thus far, the market niche may not be large enough to sustain this production of these aircraft over time. Its origins are basically from the 1970s. Several Western European countries perceived a new need for this fighter aircraft. Older designs, often acquired from the United States, were reaching the end of the mature stages of their development and desperately needed replacement. These included the beautiful F-4 Phantom and the F-104 Starfighter. The United States had developed the F-15 and the gorgeous F-16 in the 1970s and the Soviets were threatening to leave Europeans behind with the combination of the MiG-29 and the beautiful Su-27. The relative success of the multinational Panavia Tornado project had led to basically a heavy fighter that conduct both penetrating strikes and interception missions. However, these countries associated with the Tornado investigated several different projects for a lighter fighter optimised for air superiority missions. Spain, having joined NATO in 1982, also became part of the project, which had the side effect of reinvigorating the European military aviation industry. France, an early partner, eventually dropped out over concerns about its domestic aviation industry and the need for a carrier-capable variant. The Eurofighter project was surviving the collapse of the defence spending at the end of the Cold War, with a prototype first flying in 1994. Operational Typhoons, continuing the name convention that had begun with the tornado, started entering service in 2003. Around 450 Typhoons have entered service, with another 150 or so temporarily on order. The Typhoon incorporates lessons learned from 4th generation fighters, while also including some capabilities associated with some 5th generation aircraft. The Typhoon has a top speed of Mach 2, a high surface sealant and excellent thrust to weight ratio. Also, it can supercruise, and that is an extremely powerful capability. Current Typhoons carry the last mechanical scanned radar array to be deployed in an advanced fighter, although new electronically scanned arrays may eventually replace these radars in older models. These features allow it to operate in teams that include older fighters or new aircraft such as the beautiful F-22 Raptor and the skeptical F-35 JSF. In exercises, the Typhoon has quickly established a reputation as one of the world's most formidable dogfighters with extremely high maneuverability and energy preservation characteristics. 
Advanced helmet and G-suit equipment allows the Typhoon pilots to take advantage of these qualities to extremely good effect. You've all heard the stories of the computer, you know, taking over control of the aircraft so much that it basically, if it wasn't there, the aircraft would just go all loopy. Um, and the computer is basically keeping it flying. The Eurofighter Typhoon also has excellent beyond visual range combat capabilities, carrying the AIM-120 missile and having a lower radar cross section than any other fourth generation fighter. Although not a stealth fighter, which is really the niche that is coming up in today's fighter jets, it is basically designed to include low observable qualities as well as significant electronic warfare capabilities. Typhoons will soon begin to carry the MBDA Meteor long range missile in operational capacity, which will only increase its lethality of this jet. The Typhoon has trailed behind some contemporaries in air to ground capabilities, but upgrades to equipment and munition have helped close that gap over the last few years. In Libya, the Royal Air Force needed to operate its Typhoons alongside older tornadoes because the Eurofires lacked the advanced ground targeting capabilities. Surprisingly, RAF Typhoons have also operated against ISIS and sometimes in some spectacular fashion with some of the newer weapons platforms they are utilising. In terms of export, within Europe, Germany, Spain, Italy, Austria and the United Kingdom all have purchased the Typhoon. Of these, only Australia is outside the initial design consortium. The Typhoon has struggled a bit to find customers outside Europe. Various bids to sell the aircraft to Asian, Middle East and Latin American customers have pretty much failed to most parts, as the aircraft has run up against the tightening defence budgets and a tough competition from the beautiful F-35, Griffin, Raphael and apparently the endless series of Su-27 variants. The Eurofighter is a Canard Delta aircraft powered by twin Eurojet EJ200 two-spool afterburning bypass turbojets with the intakes on the belly of the aircraft under the cockpit. This position helps ensure airflow at high angles of attack. The arrangement is similar that's used on the Demonstrator aircraft when it was first designed, except that the Eurofighter's intakes curve up against the belly, while the Demonstrator's intakes have a straight rectangular cross section. Each jet can pretty much provide around 13,490 pounds feet of dry thrust and 20,250 pounds of afterburning thrust. The first two prototypes were initially powered by RB199 engines. The Eurofighter is fitted with an auxiliary power unit for self-starting and ground power. Unlike the original Demonstrator which had a compound delta wing, the Eurofighter had a simpler cropped delta wing. The trailing edge is straight and features a full span split flaperons or flap ailerons. There are small strakes on the fuselage below the cockpit and above and behind the canard fins to make sure that the airflow over the wing remains effective at high angles of attack. The canard fins are all moving configuration and have a strong andrial droop. The straight edge tail fin also differs from the curved tornado tail fin used on the demonstrator. There is a large dorsal air brake behind the cockpit. The landing gear features a nose wheel mounted under the air intakes and retracting backwards and the main gear pivoting from the wings to retract into the fuselage. All gear featured single wheels and a brake parachute is stored in housing at the base of the tail. There is also a retractable in-flight refueling probe on the right hand side of the nose. Of course, the Eurofighter features a modern glass cockpit with colour flat panel MFDs built by Smith's Industries and a wide angled HUD built by GEC Marconi. It also has HOTAS controls. The pilot sits on a Martin Baker Mark 16 Alpha 00 or 0 altitude 0 speed escape ejection seat under a frameless clamshell canopy. The back seater is the two version variant which features the same control layer as the pilot but with a HUD repeater instead of a HUD and of course uses the same type of ejection seat. The Eurofighter usually has a built-in 27mm Mauser cannon on the right hand side of the belly of the aircraft with 150 rounds of ammunition. The RAF does not use the cannon and it hasn't been removed, but the service does not stockpile ammunition for it and it's not included in training or operational planning. The aircraft has four semi-recessed fuselage stations for air-to-air -air missiles or AAMs, plus a centerline stores with pylons for four stores of pylons under each wing, for a total of nine stores pylons. The centerline pylon and the single pylon under each wing are wet, permitting carriage of extra fuel tanks. The maximal external stores for this aircraft is a hefty 8,000 kilograms or 70,640 pounds. In practice, combat aircraft do not really have a rule to carry anywhere near the maximum stores load in operational service. You can pretty much guess that a representative stores load would be about half of what it is in that specification, which is quite impressive considering that the possible stores could include long range AAMs, short range AAMs, conventional dumb bombs, CRV 70mm unguided rocket pods, various type of recon pods and up to three external fuel tanks including a 1500 litre or 396 US gallon tank on the centerline.
The Eurofighter's combat avionics are built around the Captor or previously ECR-90 Pulse Doppler Multimode Radar. The Captor was derived from the Ferranti Blue Vixen radar fitted to the BAE Sea Harrier FA-2 and the Captor's capabilities include long range resistance to countermeasures and all aspect lookup down capability, the ability to scan for and simultaneously track multiple targets in the air, land or sea with a moving target indication for surface targets and the ability to cut through sea surface clutter ground mapping for navigation, terrain following and terrain avoidance, and automatic threat prioritization and identification, plus automatic weapons release. The airframe of the Eurofighter is built of about 50% composite materials by weight and about 70% by surface area, with substantial use of titanium and lithium aluminum alloys, or aluminium for those who get very upset when I say it two different versions. Although comparable in dimensions to the Metanavia Tornado, the Eurofighter has an empty weight only of about 70% as great, while being more capable in almost every single regard. The advanced construction techniques also reduce the parts count of this airframe, with the Eurofighter having around about 16,000 structural elements compared to the 36,000 for the Tornado. Maintenance is greatly reduced as well, with the cost of maintenance for the Typhoon estimated at 25% of the total life cycle cost, while it runs at almost 50% for the Tornado. Although the Eurofighter has a greater RCS than the US F-22 or F-35, radar absorbent material is used in the inlets and and around the cockpit, and the composite assemblies were pretty much designed with an eye towards reducing RCS. The development of the Typhoon did not clear the field for the European fighter contenders. France, with its own aviation industry and its own specialised requirements, including the carrier takeoff landing capability, and Sweden would produce their own fighters, which continued to compete with the Typhoon for exporting contracts. The F-35 has come to dominate the fighter acquisition plans of most European countries, sucking up money and attention that might have gone to this beautiful aircraft. But still, for an aircraft that's effectively designed by a multinational committee, the Eurofighter has performed very well in its service and has won the excellent reputation among most aviation experts. It will continue to serve alongside both 4th and 5th generation fighters, providing a bridge and offering capabilities that complement either type. So guys, the Eurofighter Typhoon, honestly, I have a huge respect for it. First of all, it defends my home nation. and. That's obviously quite important to me. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going biased. But really, though, it is a beautiful aircraft, guys. A couple of things that really scream out to me with this aircraft is its maneuverability. It really is a dogfighting aircraft. Um, the constant upgrades that this aircraft is getting is really bringing it up to, you know, the high class standards of fourth generation fighters. Unfortunately, its stealth capabilities really isn't there, but this aircraft was never really designed to be a stealth aircraft, to be honest with you. Um, it was designed to hunt and engage uh, aircraft uh, into dogfighting capabilities if necessary back in the Cold War. The different upgrades that are going on to including the Meteor Missile and, and as well as the Brimstone Missile are really bringing this aircraft into the modern, you know, aviation combat environment and that's pretty impressive. Uh, unfortunately though, as I mentioned before, a lot of money is getting pumped into other projects and other aircraft and the Eurofighter is slowly starting to break at the seams. Um, you know, there's a lot of job cuts that just recently happened for uh, BAE for the UK in producing this aircraft. I think it was up to 2,000 people have been, you know, made redundant due to the cut of aircraft orders being made on this aircraft which is kind of sad um, I, I know how that can be with being in the aviation industry but it is a little sad to see you know it is such a gorgeous aircraft um, for me personally the twin engine is a really big plus for this aircraft you know being able to rely on more than just one engine is, is very very key and uh, you know a lot of people are going to say well Matt Smith you love the F-16 that's a single air, uh, engine aircraft and yes I agree it is but uh, I love the F-16 I'll always love the F-16 in terms of its capability in operational terms, it's got a lot of firepower under its belt. You know, it's got a lot of pylons that can really bring quite a bit of air-to-air -air missiles or even, uh, you know, dumb bombs and all that good stuff to go into kind of a multi-role fighter position, you know, similar to the F-16. It's got a lot of pylons, a lot of storage, that, you know, can really provide some heavy firepower. So overall, guys, I love the Eurofighter Typhoon. It's just a gorgeous aircraft. It really does bring in my mind when I think of it, of it just hunting down MiGs um, at high speeds and turning all sorts of tight, you know, really defined angles of attack and just sort of hunting them down as quickly as possible and pull them back out of there. But uh, times are changing, you know, we're now yeah, stepping away, well away from the dogfighting world and we're trying to go from, you know, beyond visual range engagements and, you know, the Typhoon with the whole stealth thing, I don't know, it's hard for me to judge. I'm not really an expert on that kind of thing and that's probably a topic for another day, but it is a little bit of a hard hitter for the Eurofighter because, you know, a lot of customers are looking for that stealth capability. 
Anyway, I hope you enjoyed today's video, guys. I'd really appreciate if you could leave me a comment if uh, you want to give me some feedback and a like if you enjoyed the video. If you want to support my channel, guys, I'd really appreciate it if you go check out my Patreon page or check out my PayPal uh, account, which is listed in the description box below. Thanks to uh, everyone who has already donated towards my channel, and if you do wish to, thanks in advance. And I hope you enjoyed today's video. All the best, and bye-bye.